Can't really imagine a song um, more appropriate than that we just sang for the passage we're about to discuss this morning. We just said that, we just sang to the Lord, saying that we want to see Him. And today we're going to talk about a man who did in a vision of the Lord. A vision of the Lord. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning from Isaiah chapter 6. But before we do, let's pray together one more time. Father, thank you for this privilege of being here this morning. And we pray, God, that you would speak to us. The Spirit speaks through the Word. And so I pray, Lord, that as your Word is proclaimed, you would speak personally, directly, clearly to us individually, to us as a church, to be the people that you've called us to be. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. We're going to talk about this morning a vision of the Lord from Isaiah chapter 6. So this is a very famous passage from the book of Isaiah. Um, This is Isaiah seeing the Lord seated on his throne, and we can rightly imagine that he was never the same. And so this morning... What I hope will happen is that as we see, Lord willing, God through Isaiah's eyes, we might have something of the experience that he had all those years ago. A vision of the Lord from Isaiah chapter 6. And so if you're able and willing, I invite you to stand in honor of the reading of God's word. We're going to read from Isaiah chapter 6 beginning in verse 1. It says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up. We just sang that. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two, he covered his face. With two, he covered his feet. And with two, he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called. And the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips. And they dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send, and whom will go for, and who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am, send me. And he said, Go and say to this people, Keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull, and their ears heavy, and blind their eyes, lest, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their hearts. And turn and be healed. Then I said, how long, O Lord? And he said, until the cities lie waste without inhabitant and houses without people and the land is a desolate waste. And the Lord removes people far away and the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land. And though a tent remain in it, it will be burned again like a terebinth or an oak whose stump remains when it is failed. The holy seed is its stump. The word of God. You may be seated. I believe this year is going to be pivotal in the life of our church. I think it's time that we buckle down, tighten the reins, and go full force ahead for what God has given to us. Um, 
you know, I talked about last time. You know, we want to take things, we want to take COVID seriously, but I also think that it's easy to make COVID an excuse for disobedience to God. And as I've thought about how we can start the year off on the right foot and be thinking in the way that we need to be thinking, I, the, the passage of Isaiah came to mind. That is that like, if we're going to be the people who God has called us to be, and if we're going to, to be obedient to what he has for us and courageous in what he has for us, we're going to need a proper vision of God. And that's what we need, a fresh and proper vision of God. I love this passage. There's a plague in the world today. And it's not just out there, but I'm afraid it inhabits a lot of pews. And I've, I've, I've given it a name, and this is what I call it. Small God Syndrome. How do you know if you have small God syndrome? Well, you know, a long time ago, there was a day when people called pastors spiritual doctors. Now, I'm not giving any medical advice today. I'm not qualified to do that. But I don't mind giving you lots of spiritual advice, spiritual diagnoses, because there are illnesses of the soul that, if not dealt with, are far more dangerous than covid And one of them is small God syndrome. How do you know if you have small God syndrome? The root problem with small God syndrome is that if you have this, you think that God exists for you rather than you existing for God. And there's a big difference in our lives if we believe this. You see, if we have small God syndrome, we'll say things like this. God would never. I I couldn't believe in a God who would. Well, you know, I went to church, but then this happened in my life, and so... All of these sayings betray something, an unspoken assumption that we don't quite want to say out loud, but that assumption is this, God exists for me, not me for God. God's greatest goal should be to make me happy. And if that doesn't happen, then either there is no God or he's not doing his job. It's small God syndrome. It's deadlier than COVID and much more contagious. The Israelites of Isaiah's day had small God syndrome too. They followed the inclinations, the Bible says, of their own heart. They did what was ever seemed right in their own eyes. And one day, Isaiah sees a vision. And it says that it was in the year that King Uzziah died. Now, that's not an unimportant detail. Because if you go back and read about King Uzziah, King Uzziah was one of the greatest and most prosperous and longest reigning kings of Judah. Now, he grew proud in his old age and became a leper. And that's, a, that's another sermon for another day. It's a warning to us all. But still, overall, Isaiah, Uzziah, excuse me, led Israel toward God, and he had a long and prosperous reign. Now, now think, now remember in ancient times, right? There was no, there's no such thing as a nation state. The kind of stability that we have experienced as a nation for the past couple hundred years is unparalleled in the history of the world. In most places, in most times, in most, in, in, in most of history, right? Every, all of life was very tumultuous. When a king died and, and you were part of that nation, you didn't know what was going to happen. Was there going to be a, a governmental takeover? Were, were invaders going to come and take over our land? What was going to happen? You, I mean, you had no idea. Life was very precarious. All right? 
There was a much, there was a much keen, there was a much keener sense of saying, I might not be here tomorrow. And so the death of a king, especially a good and long reigning king, would naturally raise a lot of questions and bring a lot of anxiety. What's going to happen? What's going to happen to Israel? What's going to become of us now? Uzziah died, and the throne of Israel was empty. And Isaiah sees a vision. And what does he see? God on a throne. What's God trying to say? He's trying to tell Isaiah, look, your throne might be empty, but mine isn't. I'm still sitting right here where I've been all along. I am the king of Israel. There was still, even when Uzziah was no longer king, there was still someone sitting unchallenged on his throne. And so Isaiah sees this vision of God, and I think if we see it, it can change us too. So the first thing I want to talk about is what he sees. He sees these angels, and they cry out, Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled with his glory. Holy is the only attribute of God raised to the third degree. What does it mean to be holy? We should really think about that because it's essential to the core and the person of God. At its root, the word holy means to be set apart. It means that God is distinct. He is separate. He is other. Hannah, Samuel's mother, put it this way. She said, there is none holy like the Lord, for there is none beside you. There is no rock like our God. In other words, God is in a class of his own. There is nothing and no one like him. He, you know, God and God alone can say, I am Right? No one else can say that. Everything else that exists only exists because God wanted it to exist. But God himself has always existed. We only exist because God wants us to be. God exists because he has to be. He is God. And always was and always will be. He is glorious. He is on another, he is on another plane of transcendency. The angels who are greater than any human being who have the right and the privilege to stand in the presence of Almighty God, and yet even these angels who who make the temple and heaven quake with the sound of their praises, they have to shield themselves from His glory with their wings lest they be consumed. God's holiness means that He is in a league altogether of His own. He is not to be trifled with. Only feared, revered, honored, and adored. Number two, God's holiness. In addition to being set apart, it is closely connected to his moral perfection or moral righteousness. This is what we typically think of when we think of holy. We think of moral perfection or moral righteousness. It is that, although it's more than that. We see this, for example, in Joshua. When Joshua was charging the people after they had entered into the land of Canaan, and they had conquered a good part of the land of Canaan. And Joshua charges the people, and he said that you have to choose this day whom you will serve. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. But Joshua, he says this in Joshua 24, it says, Joshua said to the people, you are not able to serve the Lord, for he is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgression or your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, then he will turn and do you harm and consume you after having done you good. And the people said to Joshua, no, but we will serve the Lord. And then Joshua said to the people, you are witnesses against yourselves that you have chosen the Lord to serve him. And they said, we are witnesses. 
What is that? What is that? What is happening there? Well, I think it's this. Joshua, for some reason, has doubts about Israel's sincerity. And he says, you got to choose whom this day you're going to serve. And they'll say, we'll serve the Lord. And he's like, you're going to serve the Lord. You can't serve the Lord. He's holy. And you're going to rebel and he's going to wipe you out, which is, in fact, what happened. But they said, no, 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 we're going to serve the Lord. And he says, "Okay, well, you are witnesses today against yourself that you said you're going to serve the Lord. So you better do it. And of course, they didn't. They couldn't because he was holy and they weren't. In Psalm 24, 3 and 4, it says, who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully. A holy God requires holiness of his people. So holiness means God being set apart, just being other, being higher and greater than anything and everything else. It means his moral purity and perfection. And then number three, a huge aspect of God's holiness is his sovereign power and prerogative. His sovereign power and prerogative. We see this in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 25. It says, to whom, this is God. To whom then will you compare me that I should be like him? Says the Holy One. Lift up your eyes on high and see. Who created these? He who brings out their host by number, calling them all by name, by the greatness of his might, and because he is strong in power, not one of them is missing. He's talking about the stars. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is disregarded by my God? Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God. The creator of the ends in the earth. He, he does not grow faint or weary. His understanding is unsearchable. You see, God is in control of everything. A symptom of small God syndrome is that we believe we're the ultimate determiner of our lives. It's not true. Jesus said, you can't make a single hair on your head turn white. We are not the ultimate determiner of our lives. God is. If God has purposes for our lives, then he is free to do whatever he wants with our lives. Because why? Because our lives don't ultimately belong to us. They belong to him. We don't exist for ourselves, God doesn't exist for us. We exist for God. Now, we, we, people are timid about that. And I just want to say, we need to embrace a big God. We need to embrace a God who has rights to do with us whatever he wants and does anyone, does not do anyone any wrong. God is in control and that's a good thing. And we should embrace it. And trust it and rest in it. Daniel 4, even Nebuchadnezzar understood this. In Daniel chapter 4, he said, All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing. And he does according to his will among the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. None can stay his hand or say to him, What have you done? Isaiah 45, 11, Thus says the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, and the one who formed him, Ask of me of things to come. Will you command me concerning my children and the work of my hands? You know, I hear some people sometimes that act like that if they could, they just waltz up into heaven and give God a piece of their mind. Are you insane? You wouldn't make it two steps before bursting in the flames in the presence of Almighty God. We, we're, we don't get to tell God what God wants to do. God's going to do what God wants to do, and you can either get on board We can't even begin to think rightly about anything until we are cured of small God syndrome. 
we got to get over ourselves. We got to get over thinking that everything in this world is about us. It's just not true. It's about God. The reason why so many people are miserable today is because they think the world revolves around them. And when you think the world revolves around you, you, for some reason, it blinds you to the fact that you're not in control. And so lots of things start happening in your life that you're not in control of. And all of a sudden you're miserable. Why? Because you thought it was about you. It's only when God cures us with small God syndrome and we realize that it's not about us, it's about God, that we're finally in a position to be used by God to actually make a real difference in the world, freed from ourselves to do and live for something that actually matters, that will matter a billion years from now. And that's for God. So number one, if we're going to be who God wants us to be, we've got to have a proper vision of God. He is holy. He is set apart. He is morally perfect. He is sovereign over all. Number one, have a proper vision of God. Number two, have a proper vision of ourselves. Have a proper vision of ourselves. Verse five, Isaiah saw God and he said, Woe is me, for I am lost. For I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the king. Right? You that King Uzziah died. And Isaiah says, I've seen the king, the Lord of hosts. The one, of the one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, behold, this has touched your lips and your guilt is taken away. And your sin atoned for. So, Isaiah, I don't hear many people today saying things like, woe is me. Unless they're throwing a pity party. But not in this context, okay? Not in this context. I don't hear that a lot. For many of us, Isaiah's response seems a little, you know, calm down, Isaiah. You know, it's a little overboard. But I want to suggest to you that Isaiah knows exactly what he's doing. Because the only proper response... For a sinful person who finds himself in the presence of a holy God is to beg for mercy because that's all you can do. A sinful person has no hope to stand in the presence of a holy God. The only hope we have, the only hope that a sinful person could ever have to stand in the presence of a holy God is if just by sheer grace God showed them mercy. Th- that, that's why this, this passage is so instructive and so important. Because that's exactly what God does. God sends an angel to take, in, li- in light of Isaiah's proper response, God sends an angel. God, you know, notice what God doesn't say. Oh, calm down, Isaiah. It's not a big deal. No. That's exactly what he doesn't say. Sin is a big deal. God's holiness is a big deal. It's not that he says it isn't a big deal. It's that God deals with the sin so that the sinner can stand in the presence of a holy God. That's what this passage teaches us. He sends an angel to take a coal from the altar to touch Isaiah's lips. Now, what does that even mean? Well, the altar is where what? What happens at the altar? Animal sacrifice, right? The sacrifices represent what? That sin requires punishment and justice, right? That's what the altar represents, right? And so the altar is the place where atonement happens so that, so that, uh, sins can be punished so that the actual sinner can be spared. And so he takes a coal from the altar And he touches Isaiah's lips because Isaiah had just made this big deal. He says, I'm a man of unclean lips and I live in the people amidst the people of unclean lips. And the the, the angel takes the coal and touches his lips. And you're just like, well, what's all the deal with the lips? Right. What's the big deal with the lips? Well, at bare minimum, it's this, right, that 
Isaiah kind of knew what was going on here a little bit. And God had a special plan for Isaiah. And that plan was Isaiah was going to be a prophet. And what does a prophet do? He speaks with his lips. Sin saturates everything, including our speech, don't you know? And so, in this, in this image, in this picture, the touching of the coal from the altar, right? The coal from the altar would be the, 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 the consuming fire that has uh, atoned for sin, right? It's, it has touched his lips. It is applied. The atonement is applied to Isaiah. He is purified as a gift from God. And then he is able to do what he couldn't do before, and that is speak on behalf of the Lord. To see God work and to be used of God in his plan, we must have a proper vision of ourselves. We must recognize that we are a sinful and unclean people. Right? That's literally what Jesus came and he preached the message of what? Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. If I tell you to repent, I'm not saying, hey, you're a great person. You know, people, people have, people have, uh, people have whitewashed Jesus as someone who just, you know, pets lambs. Jesus came and told people, you need to repent. And guess what? People repented. Tax collectors, prostitutes. He was a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But he was a friend, not because they kept on sinning, he was a friend because they repented. And he forgave them. Because they repented. We are sinful and unclean people. God owes us nothing but judgment and wrath. But, but, God is merciful and gracious if we will call on him for mercy. And he will atone for our sins through Jesus Christ. And the spirit by faith, by faith is like taking the coal from the altar of Christ's sacrifice and touching our lips so that we're purified and made clean by the sacrifice of Jesus so that For once and finally, once for all, we can stand in the presence of a holy God without fear of being consumed. And the Bible says when we have turned from our sin to Christ by faith, we are filled with the Holy Spirit. And the Spirit changes us. It causes us to think new things, want new things, Love new things, do new things. And it empowers us to live out the calling that God has placed on our lives. And see, and that's the, that's the difference, right? Any Christian worth his salt knows, you know, I say this all the time, people, some people, they don't like Christians, they say, I just think they're better than everybody else. Not, not, not a Christian who's read their Bible. Christians read their Bible don't think they're better than anyone else. The only difference is that they've begged God for mercy and have received it through Jesus Christ. That's the difference. And when you do become a Christian, the Spirit does enter your life and you are changed. Not, not so that you can be forgiven, but because you already have been forgiven. We're changed by God. And in that, and as Christians, we don't just all of a sudden get a bunch of confidence in ourselves. Hey, we're Christians now. We continue to despair of ourselves, but we rather have infinite confidence in God. Which is why Paul can say, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. So then we can be used by God in the lives of others. So we must have a proper vision of God We must have a, number two, we must have a proper vision of ourselves. And then finally, number three, to be who God wants us to be, we must have a proper vision of our mission. Proper vision of our mission. In verse eight, Isaiah hears a voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? And I said, Here I am. Send me. That's bold. Standing around all these angels. Hey God, pick me. God says, go. 
and say to these people, keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. You recognize that God... <laughs> you recognize that God sent Isaiah to preach to people and then told Isaiah ahead of time, by the way, they're not going to listen. How would you like that job? But guess what? It doesn't matter if they listen, if God told you to do it. We're not responsible for how people respond to the message. We're responsible for giving them the message. We deliver the mail. They have to decide what to do with it. We have a proper vision of our mission. And by the way, there is a, it's a, it's a complicated passage, but at verse, at the end of verse 13, he says, God essentially says they're not going to listen. Okay. Cause if they did listen, that they would turn and, and, and understand and I would heal them, but they're not. But then he says, a tenth, uh, he says the land will be burned essentially like a terebinth or an oak whose stump remains when it's failed. The holy seed is its stump. In other words, God says, but there's going to be a remnant. There's going to be a small few who remain who believe. But the point here is that Isaiah's, when Isaiah's sin was atoned for, that's when he heard the voice. He was cleansed to be a useful vessel for God, and then and only then was he able to hear the call that God was making on, a, on his life. And so we must stand in repentance and humility and faith in Christ before God. And when we do that, and only when we do that, will we be able to hear clearly what God is calling us to do. And once you are forgiven, and once you stand in Christ, you have a calling and a mission placed on your life. Placed on our lives, right? You know? Some people treat church like, like signing, up, signing up for a football team so that you can sit on the bench the whole season. You're wasting your time. Right? Why would God save you to do nothing? Why would God save us to do nothing? We're saved for a purpose, right? We're saved to do something. And we talked about it last week, the Great Commission, Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. I'm on the throne with my father. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. Baptizing them in the name of the father And of the Son of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And behold, I'm with you always to the end of the age. So this, Jesus, Jesus gives the marching orders for the church. You know, we say, you know, we say this is Cottondale Baptist Church. We'll say this is my church. And yes, that's that's fine. But this is Jesus's church. Right? Remember in Revelation? Jesus, writing letters to churches. Fran Fran goes and checks the P.O. box. Puts it in my mailbox. I open it up. Two Cottonwood Baptist Church from Jesus Christ. Uh Uh-oh. I tell you, boy, I'd be nervous about opening that one. I'm not going to lie. letter from Jesus to the churches. And guess what? There's only one out of the seven that Jesus didn't rebuke. That doesn't mean Jesus doesn't love his churches. That means Jesus is because Jesus loves his churches that he wants us to listen, which is why with every letter it says, it says, uh, you know, let the, let the church hear what the spirit has to say to the churches because the church, the church has to listen we have to be listening to what, what Jesus is telling us. And, and, it, and it tells us, too, that, I mean, that, that's just the nature of it, right? The nature, the nature of the beast is that even as Christians, we're still fallen beings. And so 
time to time, God's going to have to say something to get us back on track. Or if we don't get on track, Jesus tells us what he'll do. I'll take your lampstand, put it out. Because it's Jesus' church, and Jesus can do with, with it whatever he wants. And so we're called to make disciples of all nations. In Acts, it says, from Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. And so the mission of the church is to make disciples. And that involves missions and mission work. And, and so overseas and then everywhere in between. And so when it comes to disciple making, John Piper put it this way. He says, you either go, sin, or disobey. If Jesus has told us to do something and we're not involved in some way in doing it, we're being disobedient. So we either go, some people will be called to go. God could raise up people from this church to go. I pray that God would raise up from this church people to go. To take Christ where there is little witness of him. You see, in America, we're flooded with light. If someone wants to hear the gospel, they can find someone to do it. But there are places where if they wanted to hear the gospel, they wouldn't even know where to go. Somebody needs to go there and tell them about Jesus. And God is going to raise up people to do it. And he's going to call other people to send them. We either go, you send, or you disobey. We make disciples overseas, all the way overseas, and all the way at home. I think maybe one of the most neglected disciple-making places in the church, capital C, worldwide church, probably one of the most neglected disciple-making places is the home. If you have children, grandchildren, if you got neighbor kids that play in your yard, if you have influence over a child, you make disciples. You are called to make disciples, and that's so important. And I know many of you are just so faithful in that, but it's just worth being said. If you have children or grandchildren, God has called you to do more than to go to ball games, babysit on weekends, and give them Christmas presents. He has called you to tell them about Jesus Christ. So that your child, guess what? This is hard to say, but you have to hear it. Just because they're your children doesn't mean they get into heaven without Jesus. If you love your children, you're going to tell them about Jesus. If you love your grandchildren, you're going to tell them about Jesus. You're going to tell them, even family is hard, y'all. And sometimes you got to risk it to tell them, look, I love you, but what you're doing is wrong. And you need to come to Jesus. Sometimes you just got to tell them. Because you love them. Because you're called to make disciples in your home. It's the, most, I've, the, the home is... It, the most important place on earth. It starts there. Deuteronomy says, These words I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise. So we make disciples in our home, and we make disciples right here. And I said last time, I think the best way to do that is a discipleship group. I have a group. Kathy has a group. Paige has a group. You say, well, that's not enough groups, everyone. We can start more. You tell me you want to join a group, I'll get you in a group. But I'm t- I, I, just, I, think it, I think it is that important. And I think it's worth doubling down on, and I think it's worth saying, we as a church are going to be committed to this. Because the truth is, is we can do all that we want as a church. We can do all kinds of wonderful things. And I hope we do all kinds of wonderful things. And I got plans to do, Lord willing, wonderful things. But the truth is, is the Bible doesn't command the unbeliever to come in here. It commands us to go out there. And so at some point, 
we can do all the great things in here that we want, but at some point, we've got to put on our shoes, lock arms with another believer, and just go. And that's why discipleship groups are so important and so powerful, because Christian life is not just me and Jesus, it's always we and Jesus. And so you get a couple people that you, that you love and that you're holding each other accountable to read the scriptures, to grow together, to talk about the things that really matter in life so that you're just not wandering around anonymous, to go and to make disciples and to share Christ together and to be praying for family members and for lost people together. It's so important. And I believe, I believe if that became the DNA of our church, it would change the church, it would change this community. I really believe that. To be who God has called us to be, we must have a proper vision of God, a proper vision of ourselves, and a proper vision of our mission. You know, we got one thing to do. We overcomplicate life. We got one thing to do. That's love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. If you do that, you're going to love your neighbor as yourself. And if you do that, you're going to tell other people about Jesus. Because you can't love people without telling them about Jesus. It's impossible. And when, and, and when all this begins to ruminate in our lives and in our church, things begin to change. We begin to change. People begin to change. Families begin to change. You know, Pat said there's people out there that want to know about Jesus. That's true. Some of them, and see, some of them want to know and know it. Some of them want to know about Jesus, but don't know they want to know about Jesus. But when you meet Jesus, everything changes. And so we have the privilege of introducing people to our Savior. And so I do pray that we'll have a proper vision of God. God is in control. He rules, y'all. He reigns. You ain't got to be afraid of nothing. You ain't got to be afraid of what they're going to think. God's in control. We're in the palm of his hand. Huh? Ain't nothing going to happen to us apart from God's will. If you're walking in God's will, that's exactly where God wants you to be. If you get, if, you know, we could, we could, none of us might make it home today. And guess what? If you, if, if you don't know if you're going to make it home today, you might as well tell somebody about Jesus. God is holy, holy. Jesus died so that sinners like you and me could stand in the presence of a holy, holy, holy God. And there's nothing like it. You know, is it crazy? The angels were shielding themselves, but when Isaiah's sin was atoned for, man, he could just look right at it. The presence of God. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for today. We desire nothing more, Lord, than to be in your presence. Lord Jesus, you said that you came for us. And that, and that Lord, you will come back for us so that where you are, we may be also. Thank you, Lord, for putting yourself upon the altar to atone for our sins, that we may come into your presence. We thank you, God. With Isaiah, Lord, apart from you, all we can say is, woe is me. But Lord, now that you have atoned for our sins, we can all say, Lord, here I am. Send me, God. Send me. Send us, Lord, to do what you would have us to do. Lord, I pray this morning that maybe there's someone here listening or someone online who 
maybe for the first time has gotten a glimpse, just a glimpse, God, of what you're really like. I pray that your spirit this morning would touch their hearts. That they might believe in you, turn from their sins, trust in you, be changed by you. And be who they were made to be. Lord, I pray for our church. God, I pray, first of all, I pray that you would just begin in me, Lord. To change me. To be who you want me to be. And that you would change our church, God. That you would make us who you want us to be. That you would make us sensitive to your spirit. That you would grant us, like Isaiah, to hear you speaking. To do whatever you call us and lead us to do. Lord, we need you. And we love you. And we thank you for your love for us through Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.